All right, guys, just going to go over the top 10 things that visas get rejected for, spousal visas for the United Kingdom. Um, this will also be relevant to most visas anyway, but the, these actually come from the spousal side. First one is the wrong application form online. Very understandable that because bureaucratic systems have a form for everything and as such it's very easy to get the wrong form. One of the first things I do recommend you do is that you join up groups such as the SS groups on Facebook, um, British immigration um, groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. Because there'll be people ahead of your process which will make sure that you fill in the right form. I mean, here in Spain, you have EX 16, 15, and 18, all relevant to coming to Spain. So I understand it from the UK side as well. It's exactly the same, a form for everything. So just make sure you have the right form. Easiest way is getting in some of these groups and some of these forums and asking them, which form is it? Um, because it's a lot much easier than going through the websites. I'm not gonna put links here because in a year's time, the links are probably gonna be different anyway. So. I can't really help you on that one beyond saying go to the forums and groups. Incomplete forms. That, this is number two. The reason this happens is sometimes you get questions that you don't understand um, or you don't have the information right in front of you. For example, they may ask for a specific document number and you don't have it because you're waiting for it to be sent to you and then you forget about it and don't fill it in. Best thing to do, stick some post-its on the forms where you need to fill in this information, anything that's missing, because you can't highlight it, because you need to be able to fill it in. Anything that is, hasn't been filled in, slap a post-it on it. If you don't know, find out. If you don't know, go in the forums. Main thing is, never send the form off without everything being completed on it. Even my tax re uh, return forms in the UK, because I was pay as you earn um, years ago, and they sent these self-assessments, I just put zero and everything. All they wanted was the form back. I didn't sit there and calculate it, I just put zero and everything because they already had all my information. Um, but as long as it was filled in, they were happy. Not enough of um, proof of financial support. The 18,600 rule still stands in the UK. The sort of things that are required for this, which is basically the person in the UK has to have 18,600, is they need pay slips. Um, I think the minimum now is three, three months. It used to be six months, but it may still be six months. But I recommend is getting as much information as possible. So from the person in the UK, get six months bank statements. If you can, get a year's worth. It shows consistency, long, longer period of time, etc. I always send excess information. I don't send the minimum. We, haven't have the, we even have the receipt, me and my wife, still have the receipt of my first meal in Cebu City in 2007. We have a strong documented history together. But with the wages, show the, the bank statements, show the payments, and even highlight them. That's what we do. We highlight this is the pay going into the bank. This is this. And that way, you are making it as simple as possible for them so that they can't query anything because you're giving them the right information where they've got the bank statements, they've got the pay slips, it's above 18,600 a year income and ultimately you're trying to fulfill their obligations. There is other rules relating to um, having savings in the bank and other bits and pieces but we'll cover that in another video. The main thing is you need to have enough documented support of financial ability. Number four, wrong type of online banking statements. Getting back to bank statements, they don't want the online ones. They want the ones from the bank. You will likely have to go into the bank and ask them to print you off one or contact your bank and ask how you can get it authorized and confirmed that this is the originals. With the banking we have in Spain, what we do is we go in there and they rubber stamp it and they date it and we make sure that the bank puts their name and address on every single um, heading on the pages. Just to confirm, it comes from the bank directly, it's got all the information on there. Even though they may not need the stamp, they've got it, ask for it just overdo things there's nothing wrong with having excess the worst thing you want to do send something something off and get it back six weeks later because they just go oh this doesn't look like the original make it as original as possible um, next one is 
Number five, criminal history. Now, criminal history will affect your visa and it will affect whether you can go to the UK and it could affect either party. Uh, what you've got to understand is the time it happened, how long ago it was, and also the type of crime. Now, the definitions of what is what, you'll have to research yourself. I'm not going to fill all those gaps in. But in the UK, they have this thing called the Rehabilitation Act, where outside of a tier period of time, if you've committed no offences, etc., they sort of waiver it in the sense that they won't even look at it because it's over that time factor. Now, I believe it's five years uh, relating to employment, but there may be other things relying on this. So I do recommend researching that one yourself as well. Now the next one is previous refusals, number six. If you've been refused before, why were you refused? The first thing you're going to get is that they know you've been refused before and as such will go through this new application with a fine tooth comb. Now if you've done something illegal on the last one, I will suspect you're going to have a really hard time getting this one approved because sometimes people falsify documents and other things. I personally recommend not doing anything illegal, not trying to uh, manipulate things, instead doing everything legally, even if it takes a bit longer, because if you get to this point where you've been caught falsifying information, your application is very likely to get rejected this time around, unless something magical happens, but they will go through it with a lot of scrutiny if you've been rejected before. Bear that in mind. If it's something trivial, for example, maybe your spouse income wasn't high enough and now got a promotion or whatever, then fine, obviously he's now met the criteria. It also means that they probably checked all the other paperwork before, which means going through again should be a, a bit quicker on that side because the only thing that they had an issue was was pay. Um, but you've got to bear that in mind. If you get a refusal, you've got to take that into account because the 18-6 rule is the fundamental thing that people are having problems with and I do recommend trying to increase an in income even if you get a second part-time job or something. Get on to number seven which is the the worst thing you can do which is falsify your documents. Um, they will confirm things. They will phone up previous employers. They will um, email people. They will write letters to people to confirm what is genuine and what is not. Bear in mind, you're not the first person who's tried to do false documents. And I know um, there's been certain people on the Eastern Bloc caught with, he's a bricklayer, he's this, he's that. But the thing is, all the documents are getting processed at the same centers. So when you have multiple people falsifying documents, you start to see patterns. You start to see that everybody's got these work histories and everything else. And you start bundling them together and recognizing they're all fake. Um, the point being is, personally, I'd recommend not touching any falsified documents with a barge pole. It's not going to do you any favours, you get rejected that time, second time round is going to be much, much harder anyway. So you might as well just avoid false documentation completely. Number nine, uh, number eight, not qualified for the visa. Read up on the visa itself, whichever one you're applying for. Understand what act is the criteria. Are you a spouse? Are you a wife? Are you a girlfriend? Whatever. Because sometimes people apply for the wrong visas. As such, you're instantly rejected because your, your visa application is for the wrong one. Check which ones you, you're involved with and I'll go over some tips at the end of this as well. Number nine is forgotten documentation. Gets back to the posters. Slap it on there need passport number, need this, need that, keep them all on the document and then start filling them in. There's a list that is not extensive in the sense that um, they will add other things to it, they may ask for extra documents but these are the, the main ones they're going to be looking for. Fully completed application form, right application form, so make sure it's the right visa, make sure it's the right form, make sure is completed and there is no gaps, there's no question marks, there's no post-it notes stuck on it. You've actually completed the whole thing. Your passport they will require. Three plus months of bank statements, genuine bank statements, not the ones you just download and print off because they want to confirm they're actually from that bank. 
Um, proof of ID, this will be different types of ID. Um, there'll be a list of this, I haven't got the list with me, um, but normally driving licenses, that sort of thing. Uh, results from a tuberculosis test, TB test, to say that you're, you're clear of TB. Proof of education, if you said you're a doctor, a nurse, or got a degree or whatever, they want to see proof that it exists. Uh, recent photos <coughs> is a requirement. Proof of residence of the country that you're in currently. Not the country you're going to, because obviously you're applying for a visa for that country. So you need proof of residence, which could be... Um, for example, utility bills and bits and pieces and your residence document. I normally try and couple more than one thing together because other may say, well, we just need your residence certificate. I normally stick a utility bill on there as well because it confirms the address and the period of time of being there. It just makes things easier. So if they do go, well, I'm not 100% sure, can you send me a utility bill? Much easier just to pin it on the back and send it as an extra. The marriage certificate as well, very important and make sure you have all that. Um, legalized, notarized. Um, the Philippines, for example, they call it red ribbon. Red ribbon is where you have your documents confirmed for going overseas. You can have a marriage certificate, birth certificate, and pretty much all the other documentation done in the Philippines, but when you're doing going overseas or dealing with embassies, they want what is called red ribbon, which is a confirmation from the central government that these documents are correct and are genuine. So bear that in mind, although they say marriage certificate, it may need, if you're from the Philippines, red ribbon as well. And then other documents. Other documents could be anything. You don't know what they're going to ask for. If you've got kids, they're going to ask for documents for the kids. If you're looking at um, the bank statements and stuff, they may actually want confirmation. Uh, for example, say you have your own income back in the Philippines. They want confirmation of whatever that is. Because for example, say you own property. So any proof of that property income could actually help reinforce the fact that financially you're, de you're independent. You know, there, there's many things that they may ask for and I'm not gonna go over them all because I'll be here all day. And um, number 10, another very important one, which is forgetting English translation information. Now, when you get birth certificates, red ribbons or whatever, because it may not be in English, a lot of the stuff out of the Philippines is in English anyway, um, but you may have a problem in the sense that it needs translating. For example, say you're in a from from a French colony or previous French colony or something. It's very likely all to be in French. That needs to be translated to English, and then the copies of both sent to the with your documentation. Now. With translations, the embassies will normally tell you which translators they prefer or recommend or the only ones they use because it depends on the setup and the country because sometimes they actually say go and use doctor whatever or they may just say use whoever you like. It all depends. Um, now when you do this, you need to also have it authenticated. What we have here in Spain is they'll actually have a wax, um, what do you call it? stamp on there along with all the information of the translation because you'll have the original document and then the translation and the translation has the stamp and everything on it and it will have the the name the address contact details of the translator because there may be a confirmation that they're an official translator this is what i'm saying to check with the embassy who they use or who they recommend because sometimes there is some other stuff that they, you could get it all translated and stuff by Joe Blogs down the road, and they'll say, oh, we only use official translators. So make sure you contact them. There is nothing wrong with sending an email to the embassy and asking them for some of these questions. You know, which form do I need for this? And although it may sound like they may think you're a bit stupid because you're not looking yourself, but sometimes it can be quite complicated going on to some of these sites because a lot of things are not straightforward. Like it says here in Spain, the EX 15, 16 and 18, all relating to living in Spain, but it depends on the type of thing you're looking for. Um, so it is worth researching and asking them. Most importantly though, join the forums, join the Facebook groups and engage with people already on there. Try and find people that are from the same country you're coming from. The reason for that is they are a few steps ahead, they may even be 
already through the process and can give you what they had to do complete. Keep in contact with people in those groups and at each stage update it. And anything you find, please update them. I'll give you one of the ones for the Philippines. They had this um, meeting where spouses have to go and basically sit and be told how bad Western men are. Um, now, that is for newly married women. And I point that out because like my wife and another friend of ours, they've been married for a long period of time. So when they went to the, the meetings, they go, why am I, you know, you go, well, how long have you been married? Well, nearly 10 years. No point you being here. The point is these meetings are set up for people that have been married for six months, a year or whatever and never been outside their country. They're not set up for people that have been married a decade already because they know their husbands already. <laughs> That's the point. So be aware there is a lot of things that you have to do. Now how would I set this process up? I'll cover in another video. But one of the things I do recommend is getting into the groups. Thanks for watching.